What's good? We are back. Another episode of Paul Picker Podcast, a.k.a. Triple P, a.k.a. The Common Sense Podcast, your source for music, sports, politics, world events, and much, much more. Yesterday, we had a rock star, Keith Richardson, and now we're going to bring on another absolute vet. It's this guy standing right next to me and the author of this book. He has under 70 matches under his belt. He's fought in UFC, Pancreas, Cage Rage, and the WEC. He was a finalist on the Ultimate Fighter Four. And is now one of the voice commentators ringside for BKFC. And even with all that, he still has time to sacrifice his life, saving other lives as a firefighter. Let's bring him in. The one and only Chris Lights Out Lido. Lights Out, man. I hope I did a good introduction. <laughs> that was fantastic, man. I like the Triple P. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on, Paul. That's cool. Appreciate it. it. Appreciate it. Um, I want to take you back in a moment of time. I want to start with senior year uh championship for wrestling state championship Ooh. indiana you came yeah. in second didn't get first but what was that moment like man that that was uh that was painful man uh you know second place is is good in a lot of people's eyes not mine you know i felt like i was okay. supposed to win that thing and you know it's one thing if you go in there and there's a a guy who's just better than you i didn't feel like that was the case so it caused a lot of pain, really, and a lot of um, I did some uh, a lot of stupid things after that for several years, you know. And, and luckily for me, when when UFC came out in 1993, I didn't know what it was. I didn't pay attention. And then by the time I started paying attention, you know, really started learning what it was, I got involved in like 1998. Early, it's about the sport was about four years old. So when I got involved and I started training and fighting, I said, man, this is this is my opportunity to right all those wrongs. Like, anything that I did wrong in wrestling, I was like, I want to make sure at this time when I when I finish this sport, there's no there's no lingering bad feelings towards it. There's no feeling of failure. There, no matter what, win, lose, or draw, I'm going to do everything in my power so I have a feeling when I get done. I did whatever I could, and that's all I can worry about. That's what's up. Now, you went to Indiana State University. You studied in sports management and Korean martial arts, uh, Tan Su Do, or Do, I guess it is. And um, what did you learn in sports management? Uh, actually, I went to Indiana University, not Indiana State. Okay. Yeah, two different places. But, uh, oh, my bad. Yeah, I read it wrong. I read it wrong. <laughs> Indiana University. Yeah, that's all right. Um, Man, you know, to be honest with you, I didn't know what I really wanted to do, but I was always into working out. I was going to open up my own fitness center. Uh, I was always into working out and wanted to be part of that world forever. Um, so I really learned a lot about, you know, you know, how to put on different sporting events. And, you know, I, I thought at that point my career was over as far as competing. You know, when you get done with wrestling, there isn't, unless you go to the Olympics, there's not much more. You know, a little yeah. bit of wrestling in college, but there's nothing. And then then I start saying, oh, man, this rest, this, this, this fighting stuff is real. Like I didn't even put two and two together for a long time. And then you start seeing Mark Coleman and Mark Curl, these wrestlers, Kevin Randall would come in. And I was like, okay, maybe there, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There is something else you could do. So, you know, right around that time I start, you know, get, wanting to get out into the work world and I start becoming a personal trainer and working in gyms and was going to own my own facility and like put on these different, you know, sporting events. Um, I kind of started fighting and then I lost all interest <laughs> in getting a real job. I was like, man, I don't want to own anything. I want to fight. So <laughs> my, my, my mentality changed once I kind of, you know, I, I thought I knew what I wanted to do. And then I found out what I really wanted to do. Now, how did the opportunity come about when you got into the ultimate fighter four? Well, okay. So I've been fighting like one of my buddies in 1998 started telling me, Hey man, I'm doing this stuff like wrestling, but it's called shoot fighting. You could, you could, you'd be good at it. You're a good wrestler. So I went in and started training. This is a 98. Started training okay. a bunch and then I started fighting. And then uh, I started, you know, doing real well in the local scene, Indianapolis, Chicago, Ohio, anywhere around there. I was doing really well. Started going over to Japan to fight. Organization called Pancrase for like Ken Shamrock came from, Boss Root and all those guys. Um, started going over there to fight. Fought in the UFC once in like 2000, but it was like, man, it wasn't even a good organization then. It was it was before Dana White and then bought it, and it was. Okay. I, I thought, man, this isn't gonna make it. I'm gonna go back to Japan and start fighting. And about you know two fights later, they sold uh, they sold it to Dana White and the Fertitta brothers. And then pretty quickly, I started looking. I was like, man, this is this is in the right direction now. I really like the direction the UFC is going. 
So I started trying to get back in there, but they only put on like six fights a year. So it was hard to work my way back into the UFC. I got back in 2003. So I went in some fights, you know, lost a couple, won a couple. And then, um, you know, I was still in the mix, but it was just a different time there. So in 2006, they asked me if I want to be part of the, the comeback season, Ultimate Fighter 4, because the first three Ultimate Fighters, it was brand new guys who never fought in the UFC. Okay. On my season, it was all veterans. Everybody had already fought there. Uh, but hadn't like made it to a title run yet. So they yeah. wouldn't know why to be in it. I was like, hell yeah. And so I, I got on. Now you had some other accomplishments I've seen. Uh, you had a championship in hook and shoot, yeah. absolute fighting championship promotions, won the cage rage world welterweight championship. And you became a 175 pound Indiana state boxing champion. Is any one of those that stands out to you? Uh, I mean, the hook and shoot was a really nice one. Um, I remember they had they had a, a guy named Aaron Rodgers. Back then, you you didn't just fight in the UFC. The UFC put on six fights a year. You had to fight more than just a couple of times, and they weren't putting you on every card. So, you, I mean, you might fight once or twice a year in the UFC. So everybody had to fight in the WEC, you know, you know, King of the K, whatever was available. And I fought in hook and shoot, and I had a guy named Aaron Riley who was you know, had a couple of epic wars with like uh, Robbie Lawler and, and whatnot in the UFC. And everybody's like, man, this guy, you can't hurt this guy. You can't knock him out. And uh, I knocked him out in the first round to win the title. So that was, that was a big one for me. Really like that. And obviously I like winning the, you know, Indiana State boxing title. That was fun. Now, when you ended up retiring, man, was that tough for you? Man, it was very tough. People don't realize, like, I didn't realize it, but when, when you're fighting – as a goal-oriented person, like life just makes sense. It's like, okay, I have a fight in three months. You know, my my fight is, let's say, June 3rd. Okay, uh, so for this next three weeks, I'm going to do this. And then starting the next week after that, now I start two days. And then, you know, I got to eat this. I got to sleep here. I gotta, you, 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 life makes sense because you understand when the goal is and it's all planned out. You plan everything out. When there's no fight, you're like – what is the goal? What are you supposed to try and do? How do you how do you set your life up, man? It's like, what are the goals? To be a better father? There's no end date. You know, you have to, like, have a, a beginning and end. When do I start? When do I stop? It's not just some open-ended, what do I do now? You know what I mean? So a lot of fighters, I think you see them come out of retirement. They don't know what to do when their career is over. They just, all they've known is how to fight. And it's, it's discipline and it's hard, but you understand it. You know what you have to do. You don't know what to do a lot of times. So, um, and, and for a lot of people, that is their one and only identity. I'm a UFC fighter. Oh, mm -hmm. oh shit. So if you're not a UFC fighter, what are you now? You have to find a way to transition to something else, man. I mean, I was fortunate. I was on the fire department my whole career, like you said. Uh, that definitely helped me. I had four kids. That definitely helped me. But, you know, I it, it, did, it was a transition period for me as well. I can't imagine for somebody who didn't have those other things to fall back on, the being a father – and being a fireman, man, I mean, a lot of those people go through a, a certain level of depression no matter what. And what really made you get into being a firefighter? Man, yeah, okay, so when I was at IU, I remember one of my buddies was like, hey, let's do this forest firefighter class, you know? And, okay. Uh, we, we could dig that. And I was like, all right. And, and I remember the first, it was like over the summer, and I saw this thing. We went and watched, and it was crazy. You watch these videos, and it showed this these people out in uh, like Colorado or something and they were on these yeah. mountains and all of a sudden this like fire, when it gets that hot, stuff starts to explode and, and, and a thing went all the way over to the other side of the valley wasn't supposed to and caught that dry grass on fire. And these like 12 guys that were trying to work their way down, next thing you know, the fire's coming up at them and they had to turn around and run and that fire's going like 15 miles an hour up the hill at them. Oh, man. And they got overtaken. All 12 of them died. You know what I mean? So it was just like, damn, man. Oh, you start man. looking at that stuff and something's wrong with me, man. I'm like an adrenaline junkie type of guy. <laughs> I like parachuting and bungee jumping and white water raft and all that stuff. And I was like, man, I mean, just watching those classes is like, man, it's like, it's, it's entertaining, man. It's something different every day. Your life might be on the line. So, um, you know, I got out and I started, like I said, I started working in my field and really quickly I realized I didn't want to own a gym. I didn't want to put on events. I want to, I want to be a fighter and I'm, I'm still a personal trainer at this time. And I start I, I'm at the gym. There's a couple of firemen who work out there, you know, and they're like, man, I'm talking to them about my fights. They're like, Chris, you should be a firefighter. You'd be a great firefighter. And 
you get a lot of time off. You know, you work 24 hours on, you get four days off. You can train on your four day, eight hour days off. It's like, man, that sounds ph phenomenal. So I, I started trying out. I got on and, you know, it it, 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 uh, it was great because I love going to work. You know, what do you do at work? You get to help people, maybe put, put yourself in some dangerous situations, but you get to help people. Um, people look up to you. It's a nice thing. And, uh, you know, I, you really you really become close with the people you work with. It's like it's very similar to the gym environment. You know, you, you, the people you train with at the gym are your brothers. People at the firehouse are your brothers, too. So a lot of camaraderie is it, just a, it's just a great job. Now, produce the interview where you were talking about when you first saw uh, you first heard about bare knuckle and you heard somebody was fighting bare knuckle and you thought that was ridiculous and crazy until you saw how it actually looked what what do you think uh was like what wrong perception did you have about bare knuckle at first man i thought i thought it'd be like a bunch of guys in a warehouse with a bunch of cars pulled up around <laughs> to see the lights you know so the lights could shine in and it was these guys gonna be standing there with like jeans on just just hitting each other with, <laughs> with, with no gloves and blood was gonna be everywhere and then I was buddies with Joe Riggs. I go, damn, Joe's doing this? I said, what, what? Does he owe people money? What's going <laughs> on? So I said, okay, let me see. And I, I hit play on the video. I start watching. I was like, oh, okay, it's in a ring. I see. He said, oh, oh shit, there's a there's a referee. Okay. And then, like, he knocked the guy down. They kind of, I was like, oh, man, this is, this is different. And then just how technical they were being, like, I started realizing, I mean, you can't just go out there and, and, and just punch people. You have to be very technical because, it's like boxing on steroids. You have to be better at not getting hit. You have to be better at placing your punches. You got to be highly skilled at all this to be good at this sport. And um, as soon as I watched, I was like, man, I've been doing MMA. I, I did NHB. I didn't even do MMA. NHB was no holds barred back in, back in the 90s. You could headbutt. You could kick a guy in the oh, face. All the you could do anything, man. So damn. That, that's where I came from. That was what I thought was normal. That's what I loved. And when they changed it, I get it. I didn't really like the new rules, but it is what it is. I understand you had to make it safer so that they would legalize it. But I mean, um, but I'm still in old school. I like all that stuff. So when I watched it, I was like, man, how do you call yourself a combative athlete if you see this and you don't do it? You know, I was like, I've, I at this time, I was already like 43, though. I, I've been retired for six years. I was like, I don't care. I'm going to do a fight. I'm, I got to do one. I got to see. I got to be part of this. So. I kept trying to get all the people over in Europe. It wasn't legal in these states, and I started. So I started calling over to Europe, <laughs> talking to people. Finally, I got a hold of the people. They brought me over to do a fight, and I was like, "Hey, you know, I got one in. It was fun. I liked it." But I was like, "I had to go to England all the time. I don't know." So then, a few months later, they got a hold of me. Like Chris, you know, we we legalized it in the United States. Will you do it? I was like, "Hell yeah, I'll do this." And I started looking at the BKFC, what they had going on. I was like. I got to be part of this organization. Like this is, this is everything I like about fighting. You know, because fighting to me was the NHB time, the no holds barred. You, you two guys yeah. go in there, you go to war, man. I mean, whatever happens, happens. That's why I love going to, to Japan. It was like you're gonna fight, somebody's gonna win, somebody's gonna lose, but you're gonna beat the brakes off each other. And then, you know, if you win, lose, or draw, as long as you come to fight and put on a war, people love you. We've lost that here in the states. It's all about like I'm gonna try and out point you hold you down just win at all costs and that's i don't want to see that shit. that's boring sometimes so i want people come to fight like the toughest meanest dogs go win that fight and, and and so to me that's what bkfc offered and, and i just like man i got to be part of this you know i want to fight some but i want to i'm 40 i think my first fight with those I was guys i was 44 you know i had a couple fights at 44 hurt my wrist again had to have surgery and then i was just like man, man Let's just uh, let's just commentate this bad boy. I've been I've been working on getting knowledge for about the last twenty two years, twenty three years, and fighting. I might as well transition, translate some of that knowledge into letting other people hear it. You know, because if you just build up a bunch of knowledge and don't do anything with it, man, that's kind of a it's kind of a wasted twenty five years of your life just to have a bunch of knowledge and die with it. I'm gonna go ahead and give it to either coach somebody, train somebody, commentate, do do something to uh, you know use that knowledge you've learned. Now, I know this guy didn't win no fights, but how tough was Drew Lipton? He fought you, which I, when I seen him going up against you, I was like, there's no way he's going to win this. And then he fought Redneck Mandel right after that. Yeah. I mean, he, he'll fight anybody. That's the thing. Like, uh, yeah, the dude comes to fight, you know, um, he, he never turns down a fight. And, and you got to respect that, man. A guy who's just going to go out there, especially 
just going against the toughest competition. I felt bad the second guy I fought at BKFC was a guy named J.C. Lamas, and he fought me, and he fought uh, Mike Richmond. Those are his only two bare-knuckle fights. I'm like, man, you might want to try, try some meet your guys. <laughs> you know, like, so, <laughs> some of these guys, they just fight. Um, they just want to fight, and that's what that's what I like about this sport. Um, that's how when we first started doing NHB or MMA, as it turned into, I mean, you you didn't turn fights down. You would you couldn't yeah. turn down a fight if you were doing if you were picking and choosing. There wasn't any money in it, so you just fought to fight. And, and that's what I think, you know, bare knuckle has early on. It'll go away at some point too. It'll start turning into money. It'll be different. Hopefully, that's in ten years, fifteen years from now when I'm and then I'll leave sport to find a new thing they'll bring on. Maybe people fighting alligators or some shit. I don't know, man. Whatever it is, <laughs> they already doing that. that. I won't do it, but I'll talk about commentators. I don't know. Now, whose idea was it for you to get into commentating? You or, or filming? Uh, well, I had done a little bit of commentating before, so I kind of came to that idea right away. So I knew, like I said, my first fight for BKFC, I was 44. So I was like, man, I, yeah. I'd like to do a few fights. But, I mean, I knew the right – like, my, my – my family and my trainers really didn't even want me doing any of this type of stuff, man. They're like, you had a great career in the <laughs> UFC. What is wrong with you? Why you want to do more? And I was like, man, I got to do this. You don't understand. This is something I have to do. But um, at the same time, I, I've, I've been around enough fighting to know father time is undefeated and it doesn't go well for guys later on. Like they, they when they start taking shots because they've slowed down. The, the older brain doesn't handle it as well. And I didn't want to be one of those guys who I've seen, like all my favorite boxers got brain damage, all of them. You know what I mean? So I don't want to be one of those guys who is like, you know, talking bad, trying to talk to my grandkids. Like, what are you talking about? Just because I didn't know when to stop. It's never going to be time to stop. You're never going to want to quit fighting. I know well, that. You know, I've always known that. It's good that you got to commentate because you can still do what you love and still have a second career, right? Exactly. That's my point. Like I said, uh, I, I keep trying to tell younger fighters, like especially guys in their thirties, I'm like, man, you better figure out some kind of exit strategy because you ain't gonna want to fight. So what are you gonna do? Are you gonna coach people? Are you gonna run a gym? Are you gonna commentate? What are you gonna do? You have to have a way to be around the sport. I'm really trying to get a lot of guys to be referees and judges because we don't. Okay. There's, there's too many fighter, too many judges or referees who've never been in a fist fight in their life. How are you gonna tell somebody if they want to fight? You don't know what you're looking at, in my opinion. Yeah. So, but they're in there judging. I mean, who was there? Was just a UFC fight they said with that, uh, was that Ty Busa versus uh, Rosenstruck or whatever. I mean, they said one guy, one guy gave two of Ty Busa like all three rounds, and the other guy gave the other guy all three rounds. I was like, dude, they got the like it was a split decision, but man, it's like, come on, man, you, what are you even looking at? Did you yeah, bet on yeah. this guy? Why would how can you call this guy to win when? Other people said he didn't win any rounds, you know, and he definitely didn't win all three. So it was like, I don't know what they're looking at sometimes. So I want to have real fighters in there doing that spot. You can be around the sport. You can give back to the sport. You can enjoy it. But, man, don't quit fighting, please. Quit and When you are done, be done. But they don't know what to do, man. I understand the stuff. We need some people to talk to them and make like a, make like a, a pathway after you're done. That's the same thing with musicians. They don't understand that you got to find something quick, like, cause it doesn't last that long. Now, Kansas city card. Um, did you feel like there was too many early, uh, stoppages? You mean by the, by the judge, like by, by the, or the, doctor, the medical, or? the doctors. Well, it was a little interesting. I think a lot of times the doctors, I mean, usually we have a great uh, doctor, have a Dr. Muzzy. He does a great job. Uh, but the certain ones he doesn't come to and you're relying on that state commission, I think a lot of times they're not quite used to bare knuckle the way we are. So I think they see some things and, and, and you know, they I, sometimes they stop them early. I, I can't really question the doctor at this point because I didn't have time to really take a, a deep dive and look into the cuts. Yeah. Um, sometimes they're worse than people think. Like you have a little thing by the eyelid right there, the uh, by the – Tear duct, and like, oh, we got to stop this. That's, I mean, they could lose their vision. Um, so I don't really know what was done there, but man, yeah, I, I'm a, I'm always a person. Every time I fought in the UFC, I would I, hell even in bare knuckle, I would talk to the, the referees and I'd be like, hey, man, look, I've been knocked down before, never been knocked out. I'll keep going. So you know, don't 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 you dare stop it just because I get knocked down. If I'm not moving, you stop the fight. But if I if I can keep going, I will recover quick and I will defend myself. Give me the benefit of the doubt. 
And they would be like, thanks for telling me. I'll, 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 I'm not going to let you get hurt, but I will give you the benefit of the doubt. That's all I ask. You know what I mean? So that that's what I always want to let them know. Like, I, I'm going to be smart enough to understand how to do this. I'm a veteran. Don't stop this fight early. Yeah, and it felt like one of the fights, I don't remember which one, but it felt like the doctor probably could have caught it then and, and felt pressure from the crowd because the crowd was definitely booing <laughs> yeah. about those stoppages. They yeah, weren't yeah. playing with that one. For real, man. I, I noticed that. I was like, ooh, especially, man, that the Alvarez girl, her face was swollen up pretty bad on the eye. And they're like, yeah, keep it going. It was like, and I, I don't know, man. Like I said, uh, it is unfortunate to the crowd – you know, it's boom because they're pissed at what happened before, but it is what it is. Now, Char- Charlene Gellner, I think that's her name. What was your opinion of her debut? I thought she was pretty ferocious. Uh, um, man, uh, are you talking about uh, uh, yeah. Charlene Gellner? Oh, yeah, the one yeah. that won the female fight in man, Kansas City. She looked phenomenal. I mean, I, I didn't know what to expect from her. But yeah. uh, her movement was good. She threw good combinations. Her, her hands were on point. I mean, she kept landing that hook, bop, bop, boom. Uh, that's what swelled, you know, Alvarez's eye up badly because Alvarez looked good her first fight. She looked really yeah. good. She, she, she got beat up this fight, man. So, yeah, Keller's going to, yeah, I, I want to see her fight again. I definitely think she could fight at the 115-pound weight class as well. So she wouldn't. She she went up to one twenty one, then the other girl didn't make weight, so she wasn't happy. But she could definitely be a one fifteen pattern. And that might be better for her as far as trying to win the belt, right? The actually, oh, yeah. that's so that's Britton Hart, right? One fifteen. Because uh, Christy sure. Ferreira, uh, that oh man, that's gonna be a tough cookie to crumble right there. Well, he, he, here's a point, like you know, Free cuts down from like one forty, you know. The, okay. It, it, so that's where a lot of these girls, Britt Hart and, and, and Taylor Starling, they're walking around in one twenty five and trying to fight a a girl who walks around at 140. Uh-uh, there's a difference in power. Yeah. And, and I think it's going to be the same thing here. I think there's a lot of girls who will probably start going, eh, 125, those girls are bigger and stronger. If you cutting down, there's a huge difference than somebody walks around 140 and somebody walks around 125. Um, Friend of the show, Blaine Warbritton, what did you think about his debut? Um, Man, I... I uh, who was it? Um, Blaine well, Warbritton. He fought uh, oh, Justin uh, Martinez. Yeah, yeah, man. I, you know, well, first of all, didn't even come near weight. He didn't come near making weight. That's a big problem to me, man. When you yeah. don't, when you sign on the dotted line, you don't make weight, and you don't even try. No, man, that that that's something's wrong with that. So he so, didn't even make weight. Not even close. And they still had. He still let him fight. Well, the other guy said. <laughs> You know, Martinez yeah, just, said, no, yeah. Justin said, I'll, I'll, I'll go up in the weight. So he he got he went way up in the weight to, to make sure that they did fight. And, and he was, I mean, to be honest with you, Martinez, like, he hurt him. He knocked him down. And he landed some good shots, knocked his mouthpiece out. Um, You know, I thought he landed the better shots. You know, I, I did thought, too. I thought that uh, Warbrick did a, just did a good job of just touching him, just trying to keep busy, throwing those jabs, you know, making his eyes swell up. But, I mean, uh, I, I really think that if it went the distance, I think that uh, either – I mean, there was no way Warburton was winning. He might have been able to get a draw out of it, but, I mean, it was – you know, I, I thought Martinez was looking pretty good. I agree with you that if it went the distance, uh, Warburton would have probably lost. And it didn't look like he really worked on his cardio, which is seems to be a big thing in this sport. Yeah. Oh, man, yeah. People think it's it's five two-minute rounds. That's going to be easy. I do, I do 15 minutes in MMA. Ain't the same thing. I don't care what you say. It's different, man. This is like a difference between like a sprint and run the mile. Like, oh, yeah, I can run a mile. Yeah, but can you run it as fast as you can? No, you can't. It's different. Um, Reber versus Blas. What Ooh. do we what can we expect with that one? <laughs> man, here's the thing. I I don't know what to think about Blas as far as what are we gonna do with the long, I mean, his long-term goal, because I've never seen him out the first round. Yeah, that's can what everybody fight says. Around? Can, I mean, can, can he? I, I thought, I thought when his last fight, I thought, okay, we're gonna see something now because you know you say whatever you will, but I mean, nobody else has been able to get you know him out of there the way that I mean he did when he. I mean, I couldn't believe how just how how, how accurate his hands were. I mean, Blas looked phenomenal. I thought for sure that was gonna go two or three rounds. I want to see if he can go a couple rounds and not be tired, but I mean. Didn't happen, man. He was just on point, got the quick knockout, and, and won the title, man. So 
I, I if 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 Ryan Reber can make it go past two rounds, then we're gonna see something. But man, can he make it go past two rounds? Because Plus, it's turned into an animal. I mean, he was a great wrestler, but now his his hands are just getting better. I mean, like I said, Richardson was – he we never seen him get beat, let alone yeah. stopped in, inside two minutes. And not only that, but inside, like, where he didn't know what was going on. Like, I think after the first knockdown, he was really – he didn't know what was happening. Yeah, I just interviewed him yesterday, and – He's definitely trying to get his belt back. And I remember the first time I seen Blas fight, he hit guy with like a two piece, broke his nose and did a backflip. And I'm like, whoa, I don't know if I want to better get this guy. He's an athlete, man. And, and yeah. like I said, he was a big, you know, wrestler from Cuba. So, you know, just work ethic and strength and powers. Now his hands are starting to get good too. Like he's starting to become active with his hands. Oof, that's a scary guy. He can do it all, I think. Um, but like I said, we don't, there's some intangibles we don't know about. Does he gas out after two rounds? Yeah. I don't know. We we haven't seen it. You know what I mean? Maybe he hit the wall. I don't know. We, and, and that's where we're going to have to see. Everybody's beatable. Is that his kryptonite? Or is this going to uh, somebody get out jab him? I don't know. We're going to we're gonna have to wait and see. We haven't seen enough of him yet. We haven't we haven't seen him go more than four rounds. And he's already the title holder. And Reber's not the one you want to go to distance with after the Perez fight. I, wa- I mean, I watched that back after – before I interviewed Ryan Reber and still felt like he was going to lose the fight after knowing the the outcome already. It was like, there's no way he won this fight, but yeah. he did. Yeah, I mean, I mean at the first three rounds, he's losing, you know what I mean? And then, yeah. then uh, But he's always in good shape, and he comes, and he he changed the round, put it on him, and just, man, just start whooping him at the end of that, you know? But, I mean, just a different different mindset and, and a different, that cardio – Man, cardio is everything in this sport. If you can keep going and keep fighting and that guy can't, it's over. Oh, my dog tripping out over here. I got, I got a few more questions, and then um, I'm going to let you go do the sh- shout-outs. I know you got a, a busy, busy schedule. Thank you. Um, Canada, e- Edmonton, like, I don't know much about these fighters in this card. Like, who? what's what's the fight that I need to be looking out for? Um, well, you know, I think the, the main event's obviously good. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, Suve, uh, um, he, he was one of the guys I had from the tryouts. Okay. Uh, he's re- going to be really good. And another guy from the tryout, uh, um, that Sonny Smith, uh, um, is fighting in the, in the main event. I mean, Sonny was 2-0, and you know, in bare knuckle when he first, when he, uh, before the tryouts. Uh, uh, Suve, you know, is, is, is 1-0 now. Um, I think both those guys have some good potential to be pretty good fighters. Then we had some other good guys who had some big knockouts, uh, Chad Lucanis and, 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 you know, um, man, just uh, there's to be some a lot of raw talent there. The good news is, like, they, they don't have much background in, in bare knuckle. Putting on a couple of fights here, like I always talk about how when you do your first bare knuckle fight, you don't really know what to think and what to expect. After your first one, you go, okay, now I get it. So from yeah. then on, every day you train, you're thinking bare knuckles, so it's making sense. So if they've had five months of now bare knuckle thought process behind their, okay, now they're going to be better this time. And then after that, like, it's usually about, after, I think that between the first and second fight, you get a lot better. And then about the third to fourth fight, you get better, you know, th- like jump up a level. So let's see if these guys have been doing long enough now to jump up a little bit. And then, you know, the, the sky's the limit. You start doing like bare knuckle, for, getting like in your second year. Yeah, you get really mm-hmm. good. So let's see if they these guys can make that leap that I think they could. Who's an up and coming fighter that a lot of people might be just overlooking that we need to look out for? Uh, well, I don't know if they're overlooking them anymore, but that Perdomo is, is oh, he, yeah. for everybody, man. Yes, um, uh, you know another guy, um, uh, Nathan Rivera. I really like okay. him. He, he's a, he's a young guy who. Uh, he seems to really get it, but not only does he get the fighting aspect, he gets all of it. Like he's, I remember after his last fight, he, 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 before the fight happened, he brought me a note and he said, open this when my fight's over. As soon as the fight was over, he got a first round knockout. He said, welcome to the Rivera era, you know? So I was like, <laughs> so he gets it on a, on a, how to market himself level. He gets at a fighting level. Um, I think he's going to be a problem for a lot of people, but he's what we're looking for. He's like 26 years old, young, and, and and I love the fact we're getting a lot of guys now I'm like, oh, what's your background? Is it boxing or MMA? They're like, nah, I'm a bare knuckle guy. I'm like, oh, shit, that's what's up. When you don't want to do with those other things and this is what you want, 
Yes, that's what I was hoping. I remember back in the day when you you know when, when MMA or NHB, whatever they want to call it, it was like this guy's a wrestler, this guy's a, a judo guy, this guy's a, nobody was a bear knock, nobody was a uh, MMA guy, nobody was a uh, I want to I'm just uh, this is what I do. They always yeah. did other things first, and it was until they became like I want to be an MMA guy. That's what we're getting from bare knuckle already, and it's crazy and it's fast faster than I thought it would happen, and I love it. Yeah, I interviewed at least a couple people that said they went pro boxing or pro anything just to get into bare knuckle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I know. So I want to ask you about the book. Okay. I was actually uh, reading it, um, Lights Out on Bullying, dedicated to your son. Um, This this first part, man, I mean, I ain't going to lie, man. I was getting teary-eyed on here. Now, is any of this true? Like, you said something about, like, you getting bullied. Did you get bullied when you were a kid? Uh, I mean, not too much. My thing was when, where I hung out, though, when I was growing up, everybody there was older than me, like three years older than me. So I'd hang out with the older group of kids because in my neighborhood, that was it. And uh, yeah, I got beat on a lot. But I mean, I was just happy to be hanging out with the older kids. You know what I mean? So they would beat on me for a while. And then it was funny. Like I, they would beat on me. If anybody new came in, they would stand up for me. So it was kind of cool that I I kind of learned a lot. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the, the team. Um, but they still be, be beat up on me. If the other people went around, I was the guy who got picked on a lot. But um, but I think it just made me a lot tougher. It made me just, you know, I wanted to hang out with the older kids who I thought were cool no matter what. And uh, it kind of they didn't treat you good, but then when it pushed came to shove, they did. So I, I don't really look at being bullied like that. But um, no, but I, I never really respected the bullies, man. I, like, I remember, you know, you did have those people – you can see doing that. I never thought, man, when I get older, I, I'm going to be the guy who's picking on people. I want to be the guy who, who stood up for the people, man. Those are the guys I looked up to, the people who who stood up for people like me, man. I, look, I still look up to those people. It's been 40 years since then, but I still like, man, you know, that guy, I saw one of the guys who kind of did, like would do that for me. And now I look looking back, he's like five, six, <laughs> you know, like I tower over him, but he stood up for me when I was like 10 and I still look up to him and like, man, you know, I appreciate that. Did your son have to deal with bullying? Is that why you wrote this book or just? Well, I mean, um, luckily to for make my... people understand like autism and things of that nature. I mean, more so like my son was very fortunate. He had brothers and sisters and I'm well known in the community. So I don't think he got really picked on much, but I just see it happens a lot. And so I just yeah. wanted that to be out there for other people. Um, you know, suicide is, is, is up all over the country. And I, I just really feel bad for, can you imagine as a parent, your son or daughter kills themselves because they're being bullied or picked on? I mean, you'd never be the same. And it's like, why? Just because some other people, like people don't pick on people because they're happy. Like there's no bullies who are really secure and happy with themselves. They're, they're insecure people wanting, yeah. you know, wanting to make, you know, they feel better because they're making somebody else not feel as good. They feel like, oh, people, I, I don't know. So I just... I just want to try and, and convey the message that, you know, if you have the ability to, it is your, not only your job, it's your responsibility to help people out who, who can't help themselves out as much. And you will be looked at uh, as a hero. I, and talk, and I talk about how I look up to people still this day, like I said, people who, who protected me and stood up for me. I don't care. For the rest of my life, I'll always look at you as a hero. You can be looked at as a hero for standing up for somebody else. It just you know, help the people who need help. That That's all I'm saying. Yeah. My father committed suicide when I was five years old. So I, I wish he had somebody close to him like you. Cause it, it weighed on me. Like most of my life, you know, made me depressed most of my life. And, you know, I felt like most of my family definitely failed my father and failed me after my father did what he did. But it also made me the man I am today as well. I don't know where I'd be at today if he didn't do what he did. Um, well, that's well, good I know because you got, you are, you've been able to take that and 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 find what happened and, and the negatives and positives and dwell on the right and, and utilize that as a positive thing. Some people just never able to make that choice and never yep. able to make that happen. So uh, I commend you for being able to you know, take a situation and, and most people, you know, eight out of 10 will go down a negative road with it. And you take that, and you, you found the positive area in that. So thank you. Yeah. It's easy to like, just following the footsteps, you know, the hard thing was to 
keep going, I guess, and, and, and find happiness. That was a hard thing for me just to find true happiness in life. And now I wake up every day, I get to promote music. You know, I don't get up and say, Oh my gosh, I have to promote music today. No, I get to promote music for a living and I get to interview bare knuckle fighters and old school, <laughs> old school hip hop artists and R and B artists that I grew up admiring and listening to. So yeah, man. I mean, everybody needs to strive for some kind of happiness in life and, and doing what you love is is definitely the best thing. Uh, before we go, anything you want to shout out? Uh, Just everybody, man. If you're not checking out the BKFC yet, you got to check it out. Um, we have the app, you know, just go to BKFC or we're on a freebie TV or uh Fubo sports. Uh, but man, uh, it, like I said, you don't have people out here trying to, when decisions, you got people trying to come knock people's heads off. Uh, we put on a lot of fights. They're very entertaining. We had 10 fights last week in a nine of a minute of knockout. If you don't like that, I mean, something's wrong with you, man. Nobody ever says there's too many knockouts last night. There's too many decisions sometimes. Never too yeah. many knockouts. We got all the knockouts. We got everything you want to see. Well, I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule, man. And um, you're a friend of the show. Anytime you want to come back on, please do. And, you know, I'm always following everything you do and will support everything you do, man. My man, Paul. Hey, man, let me know when you want to come to a fight. Come check one I, out. Yeah, I heard y'all are supposed to be coming to North Carolina soon. That's what I keep hearing, too. That's what I keep I know we've been in South Carolina a couple times, but I'm thinking North Carolina is very close to having us come. And let me know, man. Like, when you want, I, I'll definitely take care of you. I appreciate it, man. Enjoy the rest of your day, man. Thanks, Paul. Take care, buddy. All right. Bye. Well, true American hero right there, Chris Lights Out Lado. Spent whole, all his life um, sacrificing his life uh, to save others. Um, check out this book, Lights Out on Bullying, written by Chris Lytle. And definitely watch the BKFC on the BKFC app and all the places he just told you, Fubo Sports, Freebie. And he's the voice commentator ringside, still in the fight game, doing what he loves. And... I'm glad he came on to the show. It was truly an honor to interview a guy that's a complete veteran in combat sports and knows more about combat sports than I will ever know. Once again, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Paul Pickett Podcast. Peace. I'm out.